When William Jones, a British Orientalist, discovered striking similarities between Sanskrit and European languages, it pointed to a shared ancestry between Indians and Europeans. This led to immediate conclusions that India was the cradle of civilization and Sanskrit the mother of Indo-European languages. However, with the rise of European imperialism and emergence of racial superiority ideas in the 19th century, the narrative changed. Europeans began to see themselves as undertaking a mission of civilizing the inferior peoples of Asia and Africa, or assuming the white man's burden. Hence, India could no longer be the cradle of civilization. In this context, an alternative explanation was offered for the shared linguistic ancestry. The theory proposed was of an ancient invasion of India by an advanced people from the West who called themselves Aryas, as they do in Mahabharata, and brought with them a great language and a sophisticated philosophy, which went on to become Sanskrit and the Vedas, respectively. This made the British invasion of India look like just another Aryan wave, bringing with it culture and learning. The narrative was problematic from the very beginning, as there was little to no evidence to support it. In the 20th century, the theory of invasion was conclusively discredited, but this still left the question of shared linguistic ancestry unanswered. The most commonly offered explanation today is that while there was no invasion, there was most likely a gradual movement or migration of these Aryan people into India. This still implies foreign roots for Sanskrit and Vedas, making the theory anathema to Indian nationalists who see Sanskrit and Vedas as the foundational pillars of Indian civilization and culture. While many respected scholars have submitted, the, submitted credible challenges and offered alternative explanations to the migration theory, that legitimate academic debate has been overshadowed by the political controversy now surrounding it. The aim of this session is to demystify the story of ancient India through an examination of its languages. We have with us a very prominent linguistics expert, Dr. Peggy Mohan. Dr. Peggy Mohan hails from Trinidad, West Indies, and earned a PhD in linguistics from the University of Michigan, USA. She has taught linguistics at Jawaharlal Nehru, Nehru University and Jamia Millia Islamia, among other centers. She's a regular contributor to various reputed publications and has authored three books, latest being Wanderers, Kings, Merchants, The Story of India Through Its Languages. Ma'am, welcome to Argumentative Indians. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Hindi, Marathi, French, Farsi, Kashmiri, German, English, and hundreds more. We are told that languages spoken by almost half of the world's population, stretching from Bangladesh to Britain, are interrelated and share a common ancestor. It is believed that an ancient people called Indo-Aryans spoke this common ancestor language, and it is when they migrated to different lands and mixed with local people, their language gave way to the great ancient languages such as Greek, Latin, Persian, and even Sanskrit. Dr. Mohan, can you please shed some light on this Aryan migration theory and tell us to what extent it is supported by your research in linguistics? Okay. Uh, first of all, I'm glad you said migration. Uh, we did originally have people talking about invasion and so on. This whole discussion, of course, does go far back into the colonial era and the British assumption that um, if there were people who in any way resembled in their words, and in some cases in gram grammatical structures like in Sanskrit, uh, things that they had seen in Europe, there must be an origin of these people in Europe. And at that time, people were just simply casting around um, just guessing, I would say, we had no information, no evidence. It could as well have been from anywhere. People said things like, okay, Indo-Germanic, when German had no language, like classical language, like Sanskrit. So why German? Okay, because it was a German who proposed the theory. Uh, then came Anatolia, the area of modern Turkey, the Asian part of Turkey. Why? No evidence again. People then said the Caucasus. The Caucasus is an area that has 50 languages, of which 
I can only think of two indigenous to the area that belong to this family, and you've never heard of them probably, or Setian and Talush. Uh, you're really fishing around, to, and they call the whole white race, which is another construct, uh, Caucasians, when in fact the Caucasus had nothing to do with it. So for a long time, we really didn't know. It could have been anyone. And while there were some people who were struggling to find out where these people would have come from, were they indigenous to India or had they come from somewhere else? Some of us were actually much more interested in looking at how these languages came about rather than trying to fix a particular place. So I'm very uninterested in where they came from, but I left it completely an open issue until the time of when the geneticists got into the picture. The first thing that happened, which upset the apple cart immediately was in 2008. And that was a study done by at least there are two Indians leading the team. It was on the mtDNA, which is the mitochondrial DNA, which traces the person's ancestry through the maternal line. So according to this, there had been no migration of any significance into India for 12,000 years. So everybody stopped dead. The word invasion vanished. We all started thinking about how this could have happened because a lot of historians could not imagine that there hadn't been people coming into India. So how how is it that there was no evidence in this particular genetic study? So people started backing off and then a word that you use, which is gradual, came into the picture. It's not a word I generally use because that's a model. Do things happen, do, do things that make change in the world happen gradually or are they sudden events? But however, the word gradual came in because it allowed people to presume that people had come and had made a presence in India, roughly in the Indian subcontinent, roughly around um, the time of the end of the Harappan civilization, they, but they couldn't prove it. Then came another study in 2017, which did not look at the mtDNA, it looked at the Y-DNA. Now the mtDNA traces the maternal line and the Y DNA traces the father's line. And it found about 3,500 to 3,700 years ago, a significant influx into India, but they had been men. And all of a sudden that excited me because I as a linguist like to look at languages, not as one language proliferating and like, a tree spreading its branches and therefore Marathi does not look like Icelandic. Therefore, I like the idea of the two parental model, two parents to a language. And here all of a sudden we find that India's woman, or at least the female line went back much further, perhaps even to first Indians because the model now suddenly said something else that hunter-gatherers travel as men and women in bands. They're not actually migrating. Then it took quite a while to get to India, up to 5,000 years. They were simply being, and it, they moved as they went. After that, migration is something done by explorers, not so much by men and women. Explorers tend to be men. And you see, even in the animal kingdom, bears, things like that tend to be men when it comes to migration. Women tend to stay back. And if we look at our own experience, you tend to find that um, the first Indians to go to the Caribbean were completely men. And what, what happened? They died out. We don't have any trace of them. It's only when women started going later that you can have a community. So I like the idea of the two-stranded model because it matched the kind of work that I was doing, looking at how languages mix. So we're not talking of 
um, people coming into India and spreading their language as it was. But we're talking of a certain give and take between people who may have come, and apparently, according to the geneticist, people did come and they were men. And we presume that the first thing they did, like all male migrants everywhere in the world, is look for women because they need to have children. And they, I wouldn't call them invaders because invaders generally take what they want and leave. These were people who settled and they settled and became Indian, disregarded themselves as local, had children with women who were local. And that was when the whole interesting thing started. Now, you want me to go on a little bit now and speculate on how I think it would have happened? Here you have, or do you want to ask a question? I basically- uh, No, I, I think we have gone to- right, I'll go on. Here, imagine now the first men come. They're speaking something. They also speak something that is very like what we see in the Rig Veda. Presumably, that was not all they spoke. But everywhere in India that men have migrated, their vernaculars have gotten lost. We don't have, and it's in any case, so back, far back in time, we can merely try to guess what they spoke, which might have been a bit like Rig Vedic Sanskrit, but certainly not as literary in its construction. Unfortunately, all the men, men who migrated into India uh, had a way of throwing away their vernacular language and keeping what they regarded as precious. The Central Asian Uzbeks came and brought Persian, not Uzbek. The Jewish migrants into Kerala brought Hebrew, but not Ladino. The, so I am the Nambudris who went into Kerala brought Sanskrit, but presumably in the eighth century, they spoke something else. So there's quite a lot that we don't know. So here are these men who come in and they marry women who are in a way ethnically different. So the gender divide is also an ethnic divide. And what do you do when you have marriages? Obviously what you want is children. In those days, more than now maybe. And you have children that are born into families where their mothers speak a different language from their fathers. Now, this, there's a lot of this in the world. The usual thing is that until the age of about five, children grow up with their mothers. And only after the age of five, which is roughly like the age at which children are sent to school, uh, you find some of the children learning what's called the father tongue. And in many places, like the Caribbean and so, um, the boys learn the father tongue and the girls remain separate. And this has happened in India. We have evidence of it. I'll show, I'll show you some of that when I show you some of my slides. So from day one, there was mixture or they would have gone extinct. So their first breed of children were regarded as Arya because they were not racist. They were not people who said, well, these are only half what we are. So here they are acclimatized. Their first language is their mother's and features of their mother's language are there in what they speak day by day and what they speak outside the home with the larger community. When they finally approach Sanskrit, they approach it with a notion that this is a bit different from what we speak. And you start beginning, you start to see leakage of local features into Sanskrit, which is interesting for me. And I have to guess at how quickly the leakage happened into Sanskrit, but I would presume it happened immediately into the vernacular. And the vernacular would have melded in some ways with the practice that local people tried to develop to communicate. Yeah. Can, want... can I quickly ask a question? Um, so what, what we are talking about here is that between, uh, and you can correct me if the time period is wrong, but between 2000 BC and 1500 BC, hmm. these people came from Uzbekistan or Ukraine. No, 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 no. Uzbek is, is the Mughal time and the Sultanate. I'm, I'm giving, those were examples. 
we think it's Central uh, Asia. Uh, the northern uh, Caspian region, probably, is what the geneticists say. Uh, let's just not get into that. Regardless. I'm not a yeah, geneticist. Hundred percent. So yeah, we don't need to get into where exactly they came from. But these people came, and you're saying they brought with them some early form of Sanskrit, but also the knowledge of Rig Veda, or whatever eventually became Rig Veda. And mm. these people obviously married the Indian, the the women in Indian women who were at the time probably speaking some non-Indo-European language. Mm. Um, and then when the children, mm-hmm. and then when the children were raised. they picked up first their mother tongue which were mm-hmm. the non indian languages the languages prob so the languages that they were speaking were probably similar to the languages of the harappan and indus valley civilization yeah i would guess they were we have some and, sort of and, evidence of that and as they grew up these mixed children um uh, after a certain age they were taught their father's language which was brought from outside which was presumably an indo european language the what i'm curious about is the people who came from outside and generally they are uh, assumed to be pastoralist tra- nomadic hmm. tribes is it how likely is it that they would have developed a language as sophisticated as sanskrit and a philosophy as sophisticated as rigveda or was it not that sophisticated at the time when it came to india and here it developed further to take its cur- the form as we know it see it's a basic axiom of linguistics that the people we least think are uh, developed the eskimo inuit peoples the uh, native peoples of north america a lot of the various groups in africa uh have some of the most sophisticated languages there's no link between how sophisticated your language is and uh, your level of development in terms of um, technology but there is another issue um as to okay let me see i'm getting a little confused at the moment what did you ask about um that did they bring no, the rigveda i don't know that they brought the rigveda i don't know exactly where they started writing it was it slightly out of india not writing composing was it slightly out of india was it partly done in india think of it as a golden age golden ages are not very long the bulk of the rigveda was written in just a few generations it's if i was seven generations of people streaming in children joining the writing or the composition people with uh something they wanted to say what they wanted to put into the form of something literary doing this kind of thing it's not a long long gradual continuous process that's why even within the rigveda we have a sense that the first and the last uh, mandalas are written at some other time later so these things one can say as a linguist so these people came in met continued having children who were by then only half um whatever the earliest ancestor from somewhere else was and to me what is most exciting is they were half indian i mean i would always be excited by somebody being half indian uh, because i like the idea that uh, you're seeing a blending with the land and you're seeing ways in which the history of the people who came is mirrored in the languages that they make now i wanted to get a little away from the genetics that you can read in other people's work i can't go through their fine um, calculations of how where people came from i'm just excited at the idea that the language had two strands to it a maternal strand and a paternal strand and that the maternal strand is what gave you the bedrock the framework or something we call the substratum and the paternal strand is what gave it its vocabulary but however they preserve the we don't have to worry about it in the sense of the rigveda the rigveda itself was almost completely uh, a preservation of the kind of high language that was brought by these men there's only a few little things in the rigveda that seem to be 
different, which suggested coming to a new land. You want, and I can get into a bit of that, how I look at um, the whole fusion process. I don't want to just look at men coming in. I like the idea of it as a process where people meet, mix, create something new. Shall I um, yes, please. show you? Um, and, and given, since my name is Yajur, I would also want to know a little I bit know. more about the Yajur Veda. Yajur Veda, <laughs> of course, is um, much later, much, much later. Yeah, okay. and in a very different yeah. landscape. Yeah, that was Definitely. in the energetic so, plains. By then they had yes, discovered uh, iron and everything. It was quite a different world. But it has, this has a certain amount of carryover. Now, uh, let me see if I can. All right, oh, I have to click share and I have to give you my slideshow. Let me take you a little. All right, so you have your genetics, the uh, very different time frame for female presence in the subcontinent and male that we just said. So you have local women and new migrants who are men, yeah? Here's a term that I just brought in, which is substratum. How I differ from the philologists that have discussed linguistics and Sanskrit and uh, the history of India at that time is um, I don't look so much at the words because the words are extremely transferable. You just have to walk around using English words in Hindi, like in English, to know that words, especially nouns, travel very, very well. What don't travel are grammatical structures. And that's where you look to see uh, what was there before and what the fusion process was. You get a very different kind of fusion process in the case of Sanskrit, because Sanskrit was very well preserved and children thought they were learning how to recite the Rig Veda and they were reciting it very carefully and paying attention to pronunciation. However, the, um, what they spoke in their daily lives was already beginning to absorb a lot of features from the local languages. This is what I mean, retroflexion. There is no language in outside of India. I'm going to put my head on a block. I think there's one in Queensland, Australia, which has one retroflex sound. But retroflexion where t is different from t and Th is different from T, the is different from D, Th, D, N, and N. And of course, there's a L, which contrasts with L. This is something very uniquely Indian. Or it not Indian, let's just say the entire subcontinent, which probably went all the way into southern Iran. These are sounds which are absent from things like Latin, Greek, any of the other languages that look a bit like Sanskrit or look a bit like modern Indi North Indian languages in terms of their vocabulary. And uh, where would these have come into Sanskrit from? So my guess is that they came in, now we have only one set of evidence of those days, that's the Rig Veda. We don't have any evidence of what people were speaking. I wish we did. I really would love to find some way to find out all the nice Harappan things, which were still floating in the air. What extremely poor people who did not find a voice in the Rig Veda, what were they speaking? We don't know any of that. We only have this document, which has been memorized and uh, which, according to my professor, Madhav Deshpande, in its earliest form, when it, in the, when it first started being composed, did not have retroflexion. That was his theory. When I heard it, I didn't ask him why he thought so, but I immediately assumed yes, because once you go outside of India, languages don't have it. So it must have come into the language when, it, when uh, the migration was here. It did not come into the, word, the competence of the people who did the migrating, but their children. So when you look at 
hybrid languages, languages mixing, features of something else finding their way into another language. We are never talking of you and me suddenly picking up a new way of speaking. We're talking about children. Everything is generational. So these men who'd had no retroflexion, they married women who did. And I'll show you a little bit on why I say that later in a few minutes. They married women who did. And the children grew up knowing that some languages had retroflexion and the Rig Veda, which we have to learn, did, does not. Just the same way that little Mughal uh, children from Central Asia knew that when they spoke Urdu and Hindi, there was retroflexion, but when they spoke Persian, there wasn't. They were, they were keeping it apart for a while. However, in their daily lives, and were there. So these were, in my opinion, new things. Okay, to know what these are. I am sorry if it looks like the Indian flag. We all have to draw this when you do linguistics. You draw the vocal tract. Now you see the tongue. The colored thing is the tongue. The green thing is a th. It's dental. The tongue is behind the teeth. And t is the orange thing. The tongue is curled backward. In between is what you get in languages like English or Assamese a few of these languages, where it's actually bang in the middle. Malayalam actually has all three, but let's not get into that. There had to be something like this to complicate the whole thing. But basically, according to Professor Deshpande, in the beginning, there was only one, and I am guessing that it probably was a th, and it got differentiated with some becoming and the others remaining the. So the splitting up of things, the same way that when we speak Indian English, we make all the English t into t. That sort of thing was happening even then. Look at this. There's a Latin verb to stand. You can see, you can see the English word stand in it. Sta, it's a t. And in Sanskrit, sta. But then when you when you inflect it to get he stands, get tishkati. Suddenly the middle, the root has gone all backwards. That kind of thing I didn't happen in Latin. So you're seeing funny little things leak, not merely there, but we're seeing the process by which they came and got adopted that perhaps um, there was a reason that they said, okay, our Sandhi rules would like us to do, to put this into the retroflex. Or maybe there was no reason at all, but they, there was a perception, it seemed, from the looking at the grammar, that whenever they made a t into a t, they gave a reason for it, but they never gave a reason for t becoming t, because that's not what happened. So this t was the new thing, yeah? Look at this. Every, um, can you see all the way to the top? Wait, wait, let me just move back. This is the part of the subcontinent where the modern languages all have retroflexion. There are two little spots in the middle um, here. This is a Korku, it's a, a Munda language, and this is a Sora, another Munda language. Uh, you look at the Andamans down here. The Andamans is also colored orange. Um, all of Sri Lanka is colored. There are some who say that the Sinhala part is not really full of retroflexion. I'll, some say some, yes, some say no, but I haven't looked at how much retroflexion. Oh man, sorry, my uh, thing is going all over my, all over the place. Yeah, here we go. So here, this is, so, so there's no retroflexion outside of the subcontinent. There's almost full retroflexion everywhere. If you can see behind that little um, thing with our faces, you'll find that the Northeast, starting with Assam and all the tribal languages, the Tibetan area don't have retroflexion, but strangely, even the Andamans has it. 
This is a very Indian thing. It's like a tag. And if you see it in the language, it means the language has been nativized. So if the only um, Indo-European language of the, um, from that era, which doesn't have retro, does have retroflexion is Sanskrit, there's a very big question as to did it, where did it get it from or when did it get it? Yeah. Now here's another way of looking at it. If you look at this map, you'll see that the yellow is the least retroflexion. So Kashmir, Andamans, and uh, the Sinhala area doesn't have much, only turned. Uh, but you have Arna in the Punjab and all that, even Patans, which you don't think of as being very um, Dravidian in this respect, they have it. And here, when you get into Gujarat and Rajasthan, you even get sometimes Arla, you get down into Maharashtra, there's Ta, Da, Na, and Arla. You get down into the deep south, Ta, Da, Na, Arla, and Ra. So you see it as an increasing thing. It isn't as though this thing is on the frontier and went out with the Arya. No, the Arya were entering a land, the first Arya who came in, were entering a land where not only was there retroflexion, all these ter, de sounds, uh, the ter, de, and re, uh, in the East, you had it as increasing the further you went into India. Um, Sinhalese is a North Indian language, actually. It's, um, that's another migration, which I don't want to get into discussing, but it's a reasonably recent migration. So here we have these people somewhere up here, coming into a land where they have terda arna and water terda dharna. And they don't use much of na in Sanskrit, except in Sandhi forms, but ta ta da da has come, right? The, you, la is not supposed to be there, but it's there in the first word of the Rig Veda, anyway. But uh, so basically you're seeing Sanskrit getting retroflexion, but getting a little bit less than, than the orange, pink, red, and crimson parts. You get it, it's like, and side by side with them. Okay, here is a comparison. It's, I'm fudging a little, huh? This is a later Prakrit. This is from Kalidasa, uh, Abhigyana Shakuntala. Um, this is some words spoken by um, Shakuntala herself. You'll notice that I've put in bold wherever you see Arna here, and it's not there in Sanskrit. So there's a bit more of it there. There's also a la, but it is not in this sentence. You see various things a little changed. Um, I'm going to move you a little bit up so that I can see this thing better. Yeah. Um, in When we studied Shakuntala in Sanskrit class, uh, all Shakuntala's lines and all the lines of, spoken by the woman were in Prakrit. And the translation at the bottom was given like this, um, at the bottom of the page, so we could read it if we didn't know Prakrit. Uh, and I, let me say another interesting thing. I once asked uh, an old woman from Kerala, I was reciting the Rig Veda, and she started reciting with me, exactly sounding like Shakuntala. So there was a very interesting, two things we're seeing here, that the languages that were side by side with Sanskrit had a little more retroflexion than Sanskrit. And number two, the women spoke these languages and of course the non-Arya. So we are suddenly seeing that there's a division between how women spoke and how men spoke, which somehow echoes the fact that once upon a time, the women were not even ethnically the same group as the men. Yeah, so now I'm not going to go into details at this moment. Um, we may not have time to go into things about grammar. Let me see where I go from here. Uh, this thing, uh, yeah. Okay, let's look at another thing that is interesting about uh, Sanskrit. Sanskrit is one of those languages, very few of them in the world. I think Zulu is another, and Zulu is pretty far from India, where you get things like ghar, jha, dha, 
dh and bh right forget about uh, the thas thas are easy to pronounce everyone can pronounce a th everyone can pronounce a p but some there is a technical difficulty in saying g because the g has your vo vocal cords vibrating and then there's a sudden h they open and then they come back to say the a uh. it's a very it's a gymnastic feat so to speak and um it's there in sanskrit uh but if you look at all these languages real punjabi real sindhi baluchi pashto all the the um, tibetan languages all the languages of the northeast assamese is suddenly in the pile with the indo aryan languages this uh, tribal language all the southern languages these are all people who avoid saying gh jh dh dh and bh they find ways around it punjabis for example if they have to say ghar they say kar and they would make it into a tone so here you seeing a nice distribution and just whatever else just think that up in the top here is where the vedic people camped out for some centuries and these languages are in the present day have doggedly survived without this feature that was brought in by these men so that they learn to speak hindi I, don't ask me how hindi has it bengali has it there's something else going on we can think of that at some other time why does marathi have it i don't know however in this area where the harappans lived and where the vedic people came at some point and spoke their languages full of gh dh dh jh everything the local people resisted it and to this day in the modern languages it's not there it's it's and that's i'm talking of every single little tribal language of pakistan the whole of pakistan the native languages don't have this particular feature so now look compare these two here's all the places that the retroflexion is there which i'm saying wasn't there when sanskrit came in it came into a really heavily uh, retroflected territory and here's the area where they didn't like these interesting new sounds that the, they made in um, in in sanskrit now why am i looking at modern indian languages because in modern indian languages tell us a little about the substratum these are the things that don't go away very easily there are certain grammatical things but i don't think i'll get a chance to talk about them today we don't have enough time but there were things that leaked into sanskrit and for example the kind of very strange hindi structure like mene me khati hu female but many khana khaya suddenly khaya is agreeing with the food and not with me anymore that's very very this area and it leaked into sanskrit because it was so hard for these guys by then by the time they started composing things outside of the rigveda it was very hard for them to think that this was not the way to make a past tense so they brought it in say in all their shokan pillars so you see things from actually this region e coming all the way into sanskrit into the ashokan pillars over here and everything so i find that this is like a forensic journey that allows us to look at the past through a different kind of genetics a linguistic genetics in the present people who avoid gh jh dh and are inclined to divide the world into th and t now here's another so that's one there's another important thing i'm going to talk quickly about spread yeah for a very long time the vedic people stayed up in the northwest and they resolved their disputes fought with local people fought with each other etc in about 5 or 700 years i'm not exactly sure how much they resolved their differences and we got the kuru kingdom ah uh, 
So here's how much a little bit of them up in the Northwest, suddenly when they resolve their disputes, here comes the Kuru kingdom, Kurukshetra, and all over this huge area, they start to spread. And where do they spread? They spread inward. So you, the whole influence of the Arya in the form of Prakrit more than Sanskrit, but Sanskrit also, is spreading into India. And here's how far it's gone. And this is again, with the exception of Kerala, which I would deal with differently. Kerala is the only language in India that took pure Sanskrit words. Everywhere else it took Prakrits. So you're seeing that um, what uh, a very local, much more local than, the, than Rigvedic Sanskrit, uh, a, a local vernacular and ultimately a literary form like Prakrit, uh, leaked into all these languages as a nice top layer. So all the words we have are from this, but the grammar is different. The, the grammar represents what the local people saw as a normal way to have an operating system, how to organize their thoughts. So you have this whole area going down to Goa, Konkani, Marathi, some, to some extent, even going into the Andhra area um, was all very, um, Nepali is a very mixed bag. I don't want to get into it. I want to study it a bit more because it has features of both these sides, the green and the orange. And then this side has a very different set of people who came initially, long before the Vedic people moved in this far, there were Southeast Asians, and there's that. There's an Asian character to Bengali, Assamese, <clears throat> Uriya, the Bihari dialects, my own dialect, which is Bhojpuri, which when we left India was quite a bit more like um, Bengali than it is now. Let's see where I have got. So I'm seeing like, imagine a volcano, which is cool. Uh, it's cooling. There's lava flow that is going inward and not outward. So... I can't put my head completely on a block and say that it is not possible that these people came out from India. I would be flying in the face of genetic research too. If uh, it turned out that that was in fact what was happening, I could probably find a way to um, synchronize with that too, because it is true that Indian languages which have gone out of India, like Gypsy, like the diaspora languages to the Caribbean, Fiji, South America, they've all lost retroflexion. And they're beginning to lose the bhad, her, her, and it horrifies me. When I was a child, we always got it right. Now the next generation is losing it. So it is possible to lose these things, but not to the extent then my instinct tells me that the direction of flow is into India and not out of India. And I think I will stop sharing. I've essentially managed to sankship me, put the whole thing. Okay. <clears throat> Thank you. Thanks a lot, Dr. Mohan. Let me bring in some of the people. Who, a lot of questions are coming up. So I'll, uh, I'll bring some of the people into the conversation. One of the questions that has come up several times is a lot of people are curious as to which language in your view is currently in India is closest to the, the language of the Indus Valley civilization. What was, what is probably closest to what the Harappans were speaking before uh, we had these foreign people come into India? Okay, that's a nice question because mm -hmm. uh, I've said, I've given my answer and nobody's ever attacked me for it. But I'll tell you, all those orange languages, everything in Pakistan, uh, Hindi, Rajasthani dialects, Gujarati, Marathi, Konkani, all of these languages have structures that don't exist in Sanskrit, don't exist in South India, and don't exist in the Eastern Indian languages. And the only, only place they could exist, and we get little bits of evidence from work done on Iran and so, is the whole Harappan area. This was how grammatical thinking was organized. So every time you say, for example, as I said, Menekanakaya, rather than 
मैंने खाना खाई कज आई एम इज मी बट नो आई एम नॉट ईटन and in fact the past tense is not a verb because you can't say um food eaten it's not food ate it's food eaten this is a very aerial thing and that area where the uh vedic people settled is the harappan area so if you want to know what the harappan sounded like except we don't have their words you have to only look at yourself we all I am a little bit funny. I'm from slightly to the east, um, but you, for example, look in the mirror. There's a Harappan. I think it's wonderful. Um, and before we get the people in, um, can you talk a little bit more about the other Vedas? Like, so that's my own question. Ooh, <laughs> no, the, I know. The, the, I'm... did the did the local languages pre indo european languages do they have more presence in the other vedas versus the rig veda i think the only thing you begin to see the other i don't know enough about the other vedas except that there's a certain amount of taking material from the rig veda that's been happening yes uh however there's certain structure like when you look at the last verse of even the rig veda I didn't even feel like I was reading it through Sanskrit. I was feeling this is smelling like Hindi in a way. I, I could understand it, whereas I'd have break my head about to figure out uh, other parts of it. There was a a mild kind of um, influence creeping in because by then. people were beginning to get used to think of think of it like babu english whenever your grandfather says this is required to be purchased by the wife of my son he's not making a mistake he's putting in a hindi sentence in a way that doesn't violate english rules you started seeing that kind of thing happening a lot more see sanskrit is a precious uh, artifact you're not going to mess with it too much prakrits even we didn't get too much happening in prakrit except sound changes here and there it's the where you really started seeing the local languages creeping in was the upper brahmins and the late indo aryans pro- let's just say approximately the 10th century okay so thank you so we have some people here who have questions for you uh, we'll start with you arindam can you just briefly introduce yourself and ask um question to dr mohan we can't hear you arindam you are mute unmute unmute yeah, yeah. <laughs> sorry i think unmute uh, this yeah. been a fantastic experience listening to you i think uh, in in simpler terms than we mostly manage uh, when we are trying to read through academic paper mm-hmm. uh, i i do have some questions around uh, you know the linguistic uh, influences that uh, indian uh, local languages as they existed before the influx of central asian people uh, you know happened and you mentioned retroflex sounds being one what i do note is that a lot of modern european languages do have retro, retro at least you know in spoken form have retroflex sounds for example spanish uh, castilian spanish in in the iberian peninsula does have a lot of you know no 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 that's not retroflex no that's not retroflex it's a trill i speak spanish so <laughs> yeah So, so uh, what I've seen is, you know, with 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 South American Spanish, they're saying perro for a dog, perro. Yeah. Where in, in in Iberia, they say perro, perro. No, 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 no. Hey, be okay. very careful. Uh, just as you have uh, in Spanish, r, the r yeah. is a different phoneme from r. Perro means butt, and perro is dog. Dog, perro. Yeah. yeah. but it with a with a trill but you cannot shorten it to pero because pero means but and mm. uh, and there's another important but but what you may have heard or what whatever one thing is very clear that other people may use uh, sounds that sound like indian sounds but they are not phonemes they're not meaningful sounds in contrast you know it's like the there is this word dhona which i well i remember on one of my tapes see, hearing the word dhona and i wrote it down as dhona and then i wrote it in my book and a reader 
wrote back to me and said, correct this. You have mistaken uh, dhona for dhona. Now, that's the kind of um, thing I'm talking about, where there's a meaning change. If you go from, it's not merely that you have accept, uh, picked up, like this ra in Malayalam, uh, you get it in Hindi film songs, Bazigar or Bazigar, but it, it's not a phoneme. Yeah, it's just a sound that has been copied, but it's not a contrast that if you said it, it means something different. That's what I'm talking about. Okay, that's a very nice explanation. I'm sorry, I'm just, I'll just keep going for half, half a minute more. Uh, uh, Czech, for example, does have uh, the retroflex L, and the only thing that I'm very curious about is that, you know, I'm in agreement with the idea that these sounds did not exist in uh, European languages earlier. Mm. I'm assuming that, you know, they, they've seeped into these languages from somewhere. I'm not even suggesting that, you know, it's from Indian uh, languages. But, uh, you know, I'd like to find out, because as you mentioned, some of these are not phonemes. Some of these mm. do seem to be phonemes. For example, there's a word in Czech called Poznal, P-O-Z-N-A-L. And mm. the L has, I think the L has a cut through it. I, uh, uh, no, it's not, it's not retroflex. Um, it is what's called velarized. It's basically it's a dropping of the back of the tongue, not raising of the front. Okay. It's, okay. A, it's a little different. But yeah, I, all kinds of things can begin to appear. As I said, basigar is not, a, not the variparam uh, sort of era. But right. it's just that Hindi singers suddenly find they need to elongate what by its very nature is a um, one twelfth of a second sound, and you want it for a long syllable, so you can't have a, a flap. You have to make it into something that's a continuant, and therefore you get this. Uh, and they don't even know they're doing it. By the way, they'd be stunned. And and South Indians, since they don't expect them to do it, don't even hear it. That's very interesting. They don't hear that we are getting it right. Yeah. yeah. Uh, thank you, Arindam. Um, I. Ashish, are you on? Um, or Abhijit? Okay, Ashish, yeah, please go ahead with your question. Uh, yeah, I was uh, I was just very curious. You said um, w when you mentioned the uh, the retroflex L, um, you use the phrase, it's not supposed to be in Sanskrit, but then yeah. it is in the very first word of, uh, of Agni Mele Purohitam. So oh, what a lovely question. Thank you. <laughs> I'm so happy. Okay, basically, what we call correct Sanskrit is whatever Parnini has allowed. So Parnini knew about Shakalya's uh, uh, Samhita of the Rig Veda, and he never mentioned that the R was there. And he would have because he knew this guy, which tells us to some extent that this R came later. So it's there. And it's not, it didn't come in as a phoneme. That's the other thing. It's a phoneme in Marathi. It's a phoneme in Malayalam. But it came in as an, what's called an allophone. It's a duh in between two vowels. So in the second line of the Rig Veda, um, this r reverts to being a duh. And it's interesting. It's the same thing as when you speak Hindi and you, you don't say ladki, you say ladki. You, you're flapping it. So this is a very normal kind of um, sandhi that happens, creating new sounds. So the only thing is that since Prakrits and Marathi had a symbol for writing la, it got used to write down um, that word in the Rig Veda. And everybody started saying, yeah, well, it's not in Sanskrit, but you know it's in the first word of the Rig Veda. I think the feeling is that it came later because the text was actually retrieved from southern parts of India, Brahmins in the south of the Vindhyas. And um, they did things to it, but North Indians do something else to it. They just don't have the, the symbols to write them. Yeah? Um, Aviti, are, are you on? Can yeah, thanks, I, uh, thank you. Thank you for uh, adding me. Uh, thanks, Dr. Mohan, for uh, for all the you know, the conversation that's happening. I just had very, um, I think these are very lame questions. Could like very lame questions, but I think the first thing that I really wanted to 
ask is like uh, what is the sophisticated language like when you use the word sophisticated like what does it uh, really mean uh, the second thing that i wanted to ask is like i i, I during your uh, talk i realized that the, the language has always been in binaries mm -hmm. and uh, and the i mean has mean? the uh what do you mean binary and the binaries uh in terms of you know when you used uh, like it's for male and female like mm. uh, you know that sort of way so has the like has it the, the culture has always been a uh, very stringent about heteronormative structure or um, or there has been you know uh, uh like active uh, uh, like feasibility for uh, other gender identities and sexual uh, identities uh, yeah these are like my two questions first and then maybe i'll go to okay let me see if i can get what you're saying that yes there is a sense of a divided hierarchical society they will tend to have uh, a difference between um, how poor speak and how rich speak in india right now in english is not there because it's the most important language in the world or something it's there because it fills a, a role in this hierarchy in english in india very interesting is that english really really spread in india pretty much the day the british left and that's an interesting point because it had nothing much to do with the british while the british were here we were speaking it as a second language then the all the primary schools with, which taught in english medium opened only after independence because before that kids only learned at say class 8 or something like that you mentioned sophisticated so there is a tendency among certain people to make a distinction between their uh either their religious or their literary language and their spoken language um it's developing in india right now with english being the high language and um the local languages so much so that if i asked you to talk about thermodynamics with me in hindi you might not be able to right so the their entire ambits are quite different but if you think about it like here are these central asians coming in the mogul time and the sultanate time they were not persians we did not have an uh, iranian invasion but they brought persian so they brought persian the way we bring english when we go to the us you know because it's our high language or as i said jews going into kerala uh, we talk about yeah they spoke um, hebrew they didn't speak hebrew nobody spoke hebrew until it was revived about 70 years ago a little bit earlier they had something else and we know what that was and they threw it away and all everywhere you look and why would they throw it away because the local language is fulfilling exactly the same need so when the uzbeks come from fargana or samarkand or these areas they come and they find that hindi urdu are doing what the uzbek would do so they just take a few words out apa khala and keep them and the rest is gone you really wouldn't know it was ever there we don't even know in the case of the nambudris what they otherwise spoke so they throw these things away so there is a value attached to the high language also and the high language is either memorized or literary or whatever so uh oh yeah the nambudris picked up malayalam and eventually they started writing in it yeah so have i got your two questions you're about uh, sophistication and about uh, hierarchy uh, i think the next question was around uh, gender structure and like heteronormative structure so if yeah. Like, yeah gender is it's not everywhere but there's enough places where you get migrants who uh, are male and having children with local women not just india the, in the caribbean there's a language i learned where carib men attacked and killed in the, in the year 1200 before christopher columbus uh, they massacred a tribe and took the women and to this day the men speak a slightly different language from the women and the women are basically told do you not to use these words um in places like south africa the 
community that Nelson Mandela belongs to, if you look very closely, they look a little different from Zulus. They are not exactly black. They also speak a language with a lot of clicks and the name of the language is Osa. Now, that is a case of migra migrating men coming in and local women in languages have even more clicks uh, had children with them. So they came, this hybrid tribe of the migrants and the local women, Osa tribe, and whereas they had a lot of other, in, in much more remote areas, more towards the Cape, uh, the unmixed form of the tribe, because um, the, the Bantu men were not interested in going as far as the Cape. It didn't suit them in terms of their crops and things like that. So you saw the unmixed form of the original people and the mixed form. So gender is a very normal thing to, to expect, partly because migrants do tend to be men. Um, explorers tend to be men. Migrants are explorers. It's only now, for example, when things get safe and the place is nicely opened up that women start saying, I want to go too. Um, for a very long time, Indian men going abroad uh, didn't find Indian women at the, at the age when they were, were thinking of getting married. Hence, as I said, people who look like me. Um, but uh, now you do. Now, uh, for example, in Silicon Valley, it's possible to just mix with people who went to the same school with you in Delhi because there's that much uh, of women and everyone there now. So, yeah, gender. Uh, thank you. Uh, yeah, do, do I have time to like ask another question? No, I, we are okay, almost Okay, it's okay. Uh, thank you, Dr. Uh, thanks, uh, thank yeah, you, thank Aviti. you, Aviti. Uh, uh, Dr. Mohan, do you have time for one quick question? We have somebody else waiting. Uh, um, Abhijit, mm -hmm. are you on? Uh, yeah, uh, can you hear me? Uh, yes. Uh, thanks yes. a lot. It was it was a, a, a wonderful, uh, fascinating pr uh, presentation. You know, uh, just two quick questions. That mm -hmm. when you talk about the grammar of uh, that group, mm -hmm. uh, uh, we obviously are not looking at grammar which is written uh, and no, 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 no. It's it's something subterranean. Yes. Uh, uh, a structure which evolves, and uh, the. Other thing that struck me, it's not uh, so much as a question, was that when you were looking at uh, 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 a domestic bilingual context, so one tongue being matrilineal and the other patrilineal, mm. uh, wouldn't the two be leaking into each other all the time? Uh, no. Of course, people learn to use different languages or mm. different registers of the same language in different contexts. So yes. uh, I think it might be interesting to look at the kinship systems and the... Uh, ideologies that uh, sort of kind of informed and ran the system uh, as it were. Okay, let me see if I can explain. We would be getting into a discussion of the difference between a Prakrit and uh, an upper Brahmsh. The upper Brahmshas are the ones where there's an awful lot of survival from earlier subterranean languages, as you put it, whereas the Prakrits have a little bit, but not very much. So we have, which also represent different levels of um, closeness between the, say, the, uh, the royalty, the warriors, and the Brahmins, as opposed to the farmers and uh, all these kinds. But when I said subterranean grammars you use, um, I think, for example, as a Bengali, you would know that um, it's perfectly normal to have no gender, and there's no reason on earth why a chair should be female. Whereas if you ask a person who knows Hindi, and you throw him a word he's never heard before because it's a new word like submachine gun, uh, he'll tell you the gender straight away because his brain is configured to, to, seg to segment the world into masculine and feminine. And I'm sure Maharashtrians do even more than that. With Bengalis and my species, yeah, Bhojpuri yeah, speakers true, do true, not true. do it at all. And Bengalis do not yeah. do this funny past tense that Hindi speakers do. So these are these are the things that are never taught in school, which is bothersome. We teach grammar as though everyone's still speaking Sanskrit. But, but the exciting things in Indian languages are the things we 
overlook and, and until someone points them out to us. Yeah, thanks, thank you. Arjun. Thanks a lot. Thanks. Hmm. Thank you, Abhijit. Um, I think that brings us towards the end of our session. It's absolutely fascinating to know that there is so much of knowledge hidden in our languages that we can study and examine and learn so much about our past and even so in a past so ancient as like going back 2000, 3000, 4000 years. There is still so much in our languages that we can, this is absolutely fascinating. I had no idea. And I'm, I just want to thank you, Dr. Moon, for this enlightening session. My pleasure. It was a pleasure to have you with us. All right. Thank you. Thank you everyone for joining us. This is going to, uh, we have been live streaming this on YouTube. So if you missed some part portion of this discussion, you can find it on our YouTube channel, Argumentative Indians. Okay. And stay tuned for our next session. Um, on Tuesday, you can find the link in the below the video or in the chat. And that's going to be on why so many people fall for conspiracy theories. So that's going to be a very interesting one. Stay tuned. Oh, no, Thank I you. have a bunch of things on chat. And you could, if you could possibly send them to me, uh, just send me the chat because I, quite a lot of interesting questions are there too. Yeah, I see a few names Definitely. coming up. Thank you. Definitely.